about motorcycles, drugs, and sobriety. What did MC mean to you? Life. It's not about getting sober and being miserable. It's about getting sober and starting to live again. Enjoy life. I didn't think I'd live past 30. I started smoking and drinking around nine. And then I got introduced to a thing called methamphetamine and that was a wicked bastard. When I call them brother, it's as deep as like my actual brother. Like there isn't anything I wouldn't do. That means you would step in front of a bullet. Nothing ensures your sobriety as much as, you know, that intense work with another alcoholic. They think they can do it on their own, but they've relapsed so many times. You have to do the work. If you don't want to do the work and you don't want to put forth the effort, you're not going to get the sobriety. If you chase your recovery half as hard as you chased that drug or that next drink, it'll be a piece of cake. A lot of people think that just because they've failed a couple of times that they're gonna be a complete failure their whole life. But you are definitely like that example that you can come from the bottom and get to the top. The motorcycle and sobriety. They go like two totally different worlds. That is true, <laughs> so, <laughs> normally. <laughs> um, explain a little bit of about the motorcycle club and what brought you to creating a sober? So for me, I knew I was at a point in my life where I had to get sober. Like I got tired of breaking out and handcuff some bad decisions, you know? Um, and, you know, I had done some time and I knew that things in my life had to change. So getting sober was obviously something I knew I needed to do. But I kept thinking, good God, when I get sober, I'm not going to have any more fun in life, right? I, it's always the I just mentality. couldn't fathom being sober and having fun in the same context, right? It just didn't make sense to me. Some of that was just being new to sobriety. Um, and you're eight years? It'll be eight years, yeah, November 6th. Should be 11, but that's another discussion. <laughs> <laughs> had one night of stupidity, but that's okay. I learned something. But uh, so I was already riding a motorcycle, you know. I, I was starting to come into the rooms. I was, you know, trying to get a sponsor and, and get into recovery. And I happened to meet a guy, and he's like, so I see you ride. And I'm like, yeah, I love it. You know, he goes, he goes, why don't you come to one of our churches, which is what they call, you know, your business meetings for your motorcycle clubs is church. So I did, and. And at the time, of course, it was a different club. It was Sober Riders, but it was just, it was like perfect for me. I'm like, here's a group of guys that are all sober, that love riding motorcycles, that do, you know, all these things in the community. And I'm like, this is perfect. This is, this fits me to a T. So that's what I did. You know, I, I started prospecting and went through that and became a member and, and, um, course started to grow in my recovery also because even though they're together they're separate so there's the motorcycle world and there's the recovery world and even though they kind of intertwine and and we expect you to be in a program of recovery to be in the club but the club's not going to manage your recovery if that makes sense yeah. that's up to you to do and so I had a blast and then for various reasons political and and whatnot we decided at one point that, that we weren't going to be able to continue to be part of the club that we were. So there was several of us that, along with guys in Washington, that said, hey, and we tried to you know, do it right and say, hey, here's some things that cause us some concern that we have concern with, and we, we'd like to bring it to your attention and give you the opportunity to kind of address it. And basically the guy told us we could take a flying leap. <laughs> so we decided at that point that we needed to stand stand firm on what we believe. So we laid our stuff down and said, okay, we're done. And so the group of us here locally started working protocol and talking to the the premier club in, in this state and and you know, 
developed a set of bylaws and and developed a patch and and got went through that whole approval process and and finally become you know conflicted MC which we are now, um, which started with nine of us and uh, some have moved on to bigger and better things and some of us are still around <laughs> the old hats as we call it but what I love about it is that particular aspect of my recovery is it creates a group of guys around you that helps develop what it is to be a man and what it is to have integrity and what it is to be honorable and and everybody helps build everybody into being a better person and um, hold each other accountable and gives you people to call when you know your butt may be falling off or you know get Sometimes you have to go to certain events where it wouldn't necessarily be somewhere a sober person would go, but you've got guys around you that are in the same boat, so it gives you some security there, too, as far as... And holds you accountable. You're not going to let each other slip, yeah. And so we get to do some amazing things. Like our charity, every year we raise money for the Hayes House, which is a homeless shelter for kids, most of which are coming from pretty screwed-up homes. Mm -hmm. Um we do a lot of charity rides throughout the year. We help with the, the toy drive in eastern Idaho, and we go to uh, Washington for um, Anonymous's big fundraiser, which they do a bunch of stuff. I go up to Coeur d'Alene every Christmas to help raise money to raise toys for the kids that are less fortunate up there, and that's just kind of what we do on a, on a daily basis. And then as things come up throughout the year, you know, we try and contribute contribute wherever we can. And that's just kind of who we are and what we do. You know, we we do a lot of AA meetings together. Um, we have a fire pit meeting that it goes on every Friday out in Middleton that we we do a potluck and we build a big old fire and we sit around there and have meetings around do, the fire. Do, like, random people come to that? Or just oh, absolutely. Them? There's... Last time I went, I think there was 85 people at that meeting. Wow. We got a couple different treatment centers that are letting their people come to the meetings, and it's just been great. I mean, that thing has – it all started during COVID. Like, when they shut all the meetings down, we're like – Oh, they did. They did. They shut everything down. They wanted you to Zoom all the meetings, which it's not. inherently <laughs> doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's a great effort, but – and so my buddy is like, this is crazy. I'm going to have a meeting I don't care what they say, you yeah. know. So he did it at his house. And that's where it started in his backyard. And then it just kind of grew. And he was doing it every day of the week. And then he's like, this is getting to be too much. So he <laughs> dropped it back to Fridays. And, and it's potluck he's style. tried to let it go, but it's just turned into its own thing, you know. Yeah. So you guys, like, do potluck style and, like, do, mm -hmm. do people. Everybody brings food. and But you don't have to bring food. And then. Every, we take donations, you know, the seven tradition, just like they do at every meeting. But in that particular meeting, we use that to help kind of keep the potluck and everything yeah. going in the meeting. And everybody so, brings their chairs, and there's chairs there, and it's just a great time. So bikers are not and non-bikers, people just show up? Yeah, it's open to the general public. In fact, there's even a Facebook page for it that you yeah. saw. And, and yeah. it's just turned into its own beast all its own. But and do people just gather and, like, talk? And do they? Yeah, a lot of fellowship. You know, we eat dinner together. We do a meeting. Um, people hang out after the meeting. You know, it's just a great, safe place to hang out. Yeah. And, and a big old party, but sober. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Yeah, everybody there. Um, and it's neat because the newcomers can come and see and, and see that people are having fun doing this, you know, which is exactly what I was worried about when I first got in the room. So do you feel like the setting is a little less intimidating to people? It's a little less formal, even mm -hmm. though, you know, and all kinds of recovery is welcome there. We just happen to follow the 12-step AA format, but we'll tell you at the beginning of the meeting, any kind of recovery is welcome here, whether you're AA, NA, SA, whatever, you know, you happen to be, it doesn't matter because it's all the same principle, you yeah. know. And there's been a lot of people come through there a lot of treatment center people a lot of just everyday normal people and they keep coming back you know and keep coming to meetings so that's that's what it's all about yeah you know developing that fellowship and that that camaraderie and and surrounding yourself with people that can 
hold you accountable and mm -hmm. it's all about and, the community like, yes. yeah community is key to success i mean from what i've learned it's true yeah absolutely so and that's just the meeting piece of it you know and then all the guys i ride with are in recovery you know a lot of us have been on the other side of the law at some point in our life you know just comes comes with the world of being an addict you know um, some some have been locked up, some haven't. What what brought you to sobriety? Oh boy! What's your past? <laughs> so I always grew up. Did you grow up in a biker? No, actually, my dad hated motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get my first motorcycle until I was eighteen because he just absolutely refused. I did have a mini bike though, so I guess that kind of technically counts. But my my side of the family, particularly my father's side of the family, were all big drinkers, you know. So it was just always part of yeah. growing up. And then, of course, everyone I grew up with were my cousins and, and family, and they were all older than me. So I started doing stuff at a way earlier age than most kids my age, you know. I was drinking and doing other things long, you know. I think I started smoking and drinking around nine, you know, and, and things just you know how it goes. It snowballs from there, and I'm like, oh, well, if drinking's that fun, then I can do this, or I can do that, or I can, you know. Um, and that progressed, you know, and then I got introduced to a thing called methamphetamine, and that was a wicked bastard. In high school? Um, uh, I was a little older. I was probably in my early 20s when I, I had done some other things, you know. back When I was young, it was cross tops and black beauties and, you know, all that crazy stuff back then, but as I got older, and then I remember it was a girl that introduced me to it. <laughs> go figure. I won't go into all those details, but <laughs> anywho, <laughs> let's just say it was part of the party favor back then. And, and I remember laughingly saying, I just opened the door and started down a road. I have no idea where it was to take me. Didn't know what an epiphany that was at the time. Yeah. But about 10 years later, I finally got, of course, in and out of trouble with the law and finally got arrested and for two counts of possession, two counts of distribution of a controlled substance. So they decided that they were about done with me. So they sentenced me to 10 years in prison with five suspended. So I did three of that five in Montana State Prison. Um, thought I was done after that. Um, got out, uh, ended up starting using again. Um, in fact, I got started using the first time before I ever got out of the pre-release center. Got sent back, got out again, which was no small feat. Um, but got some people in my life at that time and, and was at least trying to maintain some sobriety. Um, had several relapses off and on through there. Meth is a hard drug to kick. Um, but when I got sent away, you know, I'm what, 6'2"? I was 160 pounds. Oh, jeez. My eyes were all dark and sunk in my head. You could see the bones in my neck. You could see all my ribs, my hip bones. Wow. It basically looked like a skeleton with some gray skin stretched over it. But prison, being forced to prison didn't stop you? No. No. I thought it would, but it did not. It was apparently not enough deterrent. But then I had my son in 2001, and... That's when I think things started to really change for me. Because I remember seeing these old boys visiting their family in the prison visiting room, and I'm like, Jesus, I don't want to be that guy, no. you know? I don't want to spend most of my adult life here, you know? And I'd been in the service, and I'd done all that stuff, and I'm like, I've, I've got to be better than this. So I finally got into recovery here. Um, I think I walked into the rooms again Oh, when was it? 2011? You know, I had gotten off the meth in 2001. I'd managed to stay off of it. But I thought, oh, I, I got that kick, so I can go back to drinking like a normal person. <laughs> and, you know, I found out real quick that, it's you know, you don't, you don't start drinking where you left off. You start where you would have been if you'd kept going. And that was kind of a scary thought and a scary reality check. So I walked into those rooms. I met the guy that, you know, took me to the first biker church and things snowballed from there. But I think my kid, when my son was born in 2001, that's when it really changed 
that I really made me get serious about I've got to do something different, you know. Yes. So he was born in 2001. My daughter was born in 2003. Um, unfortunately, you know, I've been divorced from their mom for quite a while, but it was weird because I think, I think we got married because she thought, I, you know, she could fix me. Mm. And uh, eventually in my recovery, I got to a point where I didn't feel like I needed to be fixed anymore. And so that created a lot of problems, but we managed to still parent our children. You know, my son's 23 now and fixing to graduate college this year. Um, my daughter's still trying to figure out what she <laughs> wants to be when she grows up. But, you know, I'm married now. I have, I went to nursing school. I started that in 2001. You know, I was still in Montana then. Um, I still was on paper at the time on parole and called the board of nursing and asked them, you know, if this was even something I should pursue. And they basically said, it's a case by case basis and we can't tell you what to do. So I went through four years of nursing school, not knowing if I was going to even get, be able to get a license. But they said that they'd give me a shot when I went and applied. And, you know, I had to jump through the hoops and do that for about a year and a half and do random UAs and go to meetings and do all this stuff. And after that, I finally proved enough to them that I was safe to practice. So they gave me a nursing license and been doing that since. It's been 20 Good Lord, how long has it been now? 20, 20 years now. Almost 21. Wow. Of being a nurse? Yeah. Um, when you had no idea that you would even actually get... I went through school having no clue if I was going to be allowed to get a license. Wow. That's, I mean, that's insane. So, I mean, because <laughs> I quit going to... I was going to... I wanted to go to be a lawyer, and I was like, after the first trimester term or whatever, I was like... I ain't doing this. Like, there's no guarantee that I'm going to become a lawyer. I ain't doing this. <laughs> right. So here you are. Like, <laughs> Yeah, it was nerve-wracking. But I figured, you know, at that point, I had some recovery under my belt. And I'm like, I'm not the one in charge. And I feel like this is the direction I was pushed to go. So yeah. I just kind of had to have faith that that's where I was supposed to be. And I haven't looked back since. I mean, I love what I do. And now that I work at the VA, it's even better because not only do I get to do what I love, but I get to do it for vets. Yeah. You know, being a vet myself. And What branch were you? I was in the Army. Army. Ironically, at 17, because you know so much at 17, they wanted me to go in as a medic, and I wanted to do something exciting, so I decided to drive tanks. Funny. Could have, could have saved works. myself a whole lot of headaches <laughs> earlier on if I'd have just listened. Right. <laughs> but that pretty much explains my whole life. If I'd have just listened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you and your ex-wife divorced not because of using? No, no. She supported me through that and got me through it. And I was clean and sober, but it, it came down to other things. Um, principles, values, you know, she still saw the messed up guy that she married and, and, and that, and my dad was dying of cancer, and her and my dad kind of always butted heads. So when uh, she finally told me one time that I wasn't allowed to take my kids to see their grandpa, I was like, watch me. <laughs> wow. And first of all, watch me, and second of all, I knew that was kind of the beginning of the end there because I wasn't willing to allow anybody to tell me that whether or not I could see my own parents, you know. Mm -hmm. What what was your driving factor to quit drinking? I mean, besides your children. I mean, children are huge. Honestly, my last time drinking, I was out on my motorcycle. I was probably way too drunk to be riding my bike. But the guy that was, this other guy that was at the bar was even drunker than I was. And I'm like, I'll follow you home to make sure you get home. And he got a wild hair. This was on State Street back in the day when they were doing construction. And he decided to just take off and jumped out past the cones to, to pass the cars and hit a truck head on. And I managed to be able to help him. And he ended up living. I've, I've run into him several times since. But uh, I was like, all right, enough's enough, you know, because that could be me easy, easy enough. So That's traumatizing. And, I, you know, I had to think about my kids, too, you know. Mm -hmm. 
as, as tough as it was for a while, because she kept me from my kids for a while, but as tough as it was, I was like, I got to be around for them. Because mm. I knew eventually everything comes full circle, you know, and so that decision I don't regret at all. That was the best thing I ever did was decide to get clean and sober and stay there. And you went through, like, recovery or, like, re like rehab? rehab? Most of my stuff was all AA. Okay. Um, you know, that last time I, I got into the meetings and I did exactly what they said. I went to meetings. I got a sponsor. I started doing the work. You know, I got a book. I got a 12 by 12. I started putting pen to paper. And I just didn't mess around this time. I just got in and did what I was told to do as best as I could do it. And... You know, when you're able to start identifying some of those things that drive you. Yeah. You know, why did I, you know, drinking is a symptom. You know, why did I feel like I needed to numb those emotions or why did I need to hide who I was, you know? And, and so you start to identify some of that and be able to let some of that go. And, and then the need to drink kind of goes away. Yeah. You know, that desire to, to numb yourself isn't there, you know, isn't there anymore. So what do you think kept you accountable? Was it like the, the group and the, reco the a or recovery and the bike? Honestly, for me, it was a little of both. But I would say the accountability to my brothers was it just I was so intent on not letting them down, yeah. you know, because that brotherhood is so tight. I mean, it's as... When I call them brother, it's as deep as, like, my actual brother. Like, mm -hmm. there isn't anything I wouldn't do. Like, in the military, you know, you've got a group of guys you call brothers. And to them, that means you would step in front of a bullet, you know, and that's exactly what we would do for each other. Yeah. You know, and that's how tight we are. And, and we can call each other on our BS, you know, when we see each other acting or, or being a certain way, we can call them out and say, hey, what is going on, man? Mm -hmm. You know, and and that's what I need. You know, I need that. I've always kind of been a rebel anyway. So I've always needed a little bit firmer hand than maybe some others would. And, and you know, I don't need a whitewash down. I need you to just tell me how it is, you know. And uh, which is probably why boot camp was so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I get to do things now. You know, I don't do service work like a traditional AA service work. I'm not chairing meetings and doing that. But just about everything we did, we, we used to take, before COVID, we would take AA meetings into the prison. Um, oh. We would do prison car and bike shows to be able to take that time to talk to the guys on the inside and say, hey, you don't have to keep doing what you've been doing all along. There's a different way of doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we love doing that kind of stuff. And you know? isn't it, there's, it's like a, what is, what is the word, humbling feeling when you're like helping others go, like quit something that was so detrimental to them that you already like let go of. And I, I'm horrible at quoting things, but there's a, 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 a paragraph in the big book that talks about nothing ensures your sobriety as much as, you know, that intense work with another alcoholic. And, and, you know, maintaining that, that uh, spiritual condition so that you're in a position to be able to help somebody else. Yeah. You know, I've never been able to be more present in my own life or present for other people than I am now because it's not all about Paul anymore. Right. You know, yeah. ironically, I'm able to think and do things for other people in, in life now. So that, that like, that's a key, huge key word, like, being more present, so you're way more present than you ever were. Absolutely. And it's changed your life and many others because you're present. Yes, like, because I'm able to show up and suit up and be there. Mm -hmm. You know, before it was all about Paul and what could Paul get for Paul, you know what I mean? And it's not, you know, not only for me now is it not about Paul, but it's about my club as a whole. It's about all the other people in my life. It's about all the other people in the community, you know. We just had a beautiful ride on the first, you know, raising money for the all 12-step club in Caldwell, which is another 
place where they have AA meetings and recovery, and you know, it gives people a safe place to go when their butts may be falling off, you know. And that's just the stuff we do all the time. And and our names getting out there now, like we've been asked to road guard for the ride to breathe ride this coming Saturday because people know enough about us and know enough about who we are and how we ride and what we do that they trust us to do that. Like we've done the, what's the one in Caldwell, the Hope Not Dope run that they did last year. Um, we just, you know, we've done the grand opening for the Hoffer House, which is a uh, sober living house, which is also named after one of our brothers we lost a year ago in May. Oh. Um, he got hit head on on Highway 30. Ugh. So, you know, and he was really active in the Payette drug and alcohol community and Payette drug court. And, you know, he was an alcohol and drug counselor. And that's kind of what he did for, I mean, that's what he did for a living. But he, he actually sponsored a lot of us guys, you know, at the time. Um, so it's all about taking what you learned and giving it back. Um, do you, can you share a success story that, like, um, that really... Like, other than my life? <laughs> well, like, the, like, a super impactful moment that was, like, I don't know, like, maybe somebody came in and they were struggling super bad, and the accountability part was able, like, you guys were able to... Well, that's just about all of us in oh, the yeah. club, but we actually got... We ran into a kid that had to be, they were somewhere in that 18 to 20 range, that they had pre previously been at the Hayes house. And they remember us, you know, coming and picking them up in a level and taking them to dinner and getting them Christmas presents and all that. And now they're in recovery and they're into their young adulthood and, and they were talking about conflicted and all the guys and how they still remember what a special moment it was. It was the first time that they ever felt like Somebody cared about them. Yeah. And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, will feed you for a long time. Yeah. You know, especially on those days where you're like, is this even worth it? You know? Mm -hmm. And I love stuff like that. We've seen a lot of people come in early in recovery and be able to stick around, you know, and, and start to get it. You know, you start to see the change and you just start to see the light come on in their eyes. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. So when you decided to quit drinking, was it at that moment that you were like, I'm done, I never want to go back? Or did you have a hard time, hard time in the beginning? Like, I think the quitting drinking was much easier than the quitting the, the drugs, okay. particularly the methamphetamine. I struggled with that for a long time, off and on. I feel like it took a year, a year and a half of, I'd do good for a while and then I'd relapse. And I'd do good for a while and I'd relapse. With meth? Yeah, but part of that was the pull of the drug, but part of that was I don't think I was really working a good program then either. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd show up to meetings, but I didn't, do, I didn't want to do the work. I didn't want to get a sponsor. I didn't want to, you know. I thought I would be able to pick up recovery through osmosis by just showing up. And, you know, that thing's de this program's designed in a way that you have to do the work. There's so many people out there that have, like, strong addictions to drugs or alcohol and then they think they can do it on their own but they've relapsed so many times like what do you tell people like how do you get them to pull out of I mean people have to like do it for themselves obviously they do. but like what is a driving force that you've seen some of these people like relapse over and over and then they finally like snap one day like oh I got this usually they end up finding a sponsor they don't they don't pick one that seems to fit their personality they find one that's going to actually make them work you can't really make somebody do it but we'll either say here's here's what you need to do or or don't bother you know i've had i've had a sponsor give me 20 bucks and says you're obviously not done go out and keep practicing until you're you're ready to be done and you know that's kind of a earth shattering moment like if you don't want to do the work and you don't want to put forth the effort you're not going to get the sobriety you yeah. know and you got to dig up that stuff to figure out what is driving you to do that in the first place. Because yeah. you, you mentioned unmasking, like, emotions or, I mean, a lot of us have unmasked Trauma. things. And yeah. then we, like, 
are sober and we're like, oh crap, that's why. Like it's like eye opening, like why you were drinking all those <laughs> years. Yeah. So there's stuff from my childhood. There's stuff from my own feelings of inadequacy growing up. You know, I, I equate recovery to peeling an onion. You know, you, you get there and the onion's all dry and, and crusty on the outside and you peel some layers and you get to see the beautiful onion. But then you got to keep peeling those layers. Yes. You know, you got to keep working those layers back. Um, the other thing I heard that always stuck with me is is when you're working a program of recovery, if you're doing the work, you're moving forward, you're taking the steps to stay sober. But as soon as you stop moving forward, it's like be, trying to go uphill on a downhill escalator. If you're taking the steps and moving forward, you're gaining ground, you're making progress. But as soon as you stop doing anything, you're automatically moving backwards. Yes. The last relapse between my, my drugs and the alcohol, I finally realized that and what I learned from that last relapse was I was setting myself up to relapse long before I ever took a drink. I started hanging out in shady places. I was going and doing karaoke. I was going and doing all these things by myself. So I was setting myself up and giving myself permission to relapse long before I actually yeah. relapsed. And so I had to, I have to check my motives on everything I do now. I have to a lot of times I will use other people in recovery as a sounding board of, this is what I'm thinking. What does this sound like to you? You know, because obviously my best thinking got me screwed up for a lot of years, right? So that's why, and that's how that program's designed, you know? And that's why I surround myself with so many people in recovery. Yeah. And, and it's funny because my wife is a normie. You know, she can drink or not drink or, you know. And that's, the, that's the second time I've heard this on my podcast. Somebody else said he was a normie, and I was like, what is that? And he's like, oh, I can, like, have one beer the whole entire week and just put it back in the fridge. I'm like, that's a thing? Yeah, <laughs> like, it is a thing. <laughs> uh, I, it's, it's like Mars to me because, you know, I didn't stop drinking until either one, it was what, all gone. What or is it they say one is one is One is too many and a thousand is never enough. Right. Yeah, that was, uh, yeah. So were you like drinking like daily and, um, but you said towards the end I was drinking a lot. I don't know if I would say it was daily, but it was, it was evident in my life. You know, if I went into work and worked a 12 hour shift and then came home, my hands were shaking and I was like, okay, something's got to give here. You and you're, know? you being a nurse, and you, you other knew people what's happening. It. Yeah. And I knew what was going on. I'm like, this is insane. You know? So did you. A lot of people ask about withdrawals and stuff. So you obviously knew that you had a little shaking issue, but it wasn't something that you needed to go get medical yeah, We actually for. do a lot of medical treatment for alcohol withdrawal. Alcohol withdrawal is one of the worst withdrawals there is. So that, yes. And when people withdraw from alcohol several times, they keep going back. Like That, it seems so miserable and so dangerous. It is. It is, and we deal with a lot of, well, in my profession, I deal with a lot of vets. You know, they just can't quite get there, right? So they'll do well for a while, then they'll relapse. Because they're come masking back in something. To detox, and then they'll, you know. And the problem is, is, you know, especially alcohol, the more you drink, and I mean, these people are drinking gallons of vodka a day, oh, you know. And eventually, either your liver's going to shut down, it takes medication, whether it's Ativan or you know, uh, uh, I just went blank all of a sudden. Some of these other medications we use um, to be able to mellow them out enough they can get through the withdrawals. But, I mean, you can have seizures. You can end up with fluid on your brain, all this stuff from alcohol, you know, and fluid it's insane. You can liver failure, kidney failure, you know, all this stuff. And, you know, for some people, they don't decide to quit until it's a little too late. Some um. never do. Yeah. But you get you get in recovery for a period of time and what you find is you lose a fair amount of people to suicide too. Because they would rather die than go back to using again. And so you get some people that get in that in that that spot where they feel like they want to go use but they would rather die than go use. So, you know, and that's 
I did not know that. That's a huge thing, too. Wow. And you see it particularly with vets also. Actually, uh, suicide is one of the leading causes of death among vets. Mm -hmm. And a use of a firearm for a vet to commit suicide is like 70% higher than the normal population. Really? Because most of us have firearms and most yeah. of us are trained to use them. And so... Wow. Yeah. So suicides in vets is huge. What advice would you give somebody that's struggling with addiction? Get into a meeting. You know, do the meetings. If it takes two meetings a day, three meetings a day, it doesn't matter. Do it. Find a sponsor. How do you get, get people... Get that phone list, you know? How do you get people to set their pride aside? How important is it to you? I heard somebody say once, if you chase your recovery half as hard as you chased that drug or that next drink, it'll be a piece of cake. Yeah, that's a good one. Problem is most people don't want to do that self-discovery because they don't always like what they find looking back at them in the mirror, you know? No. But the whole point is not to shame you over that. The point is to identify it, deal with it, let it go, and start building on the person you want to be, not the person you used to be. Right. You know, become that person that you want to be. And it takes practice, and it takes people teaching you how to do that sometimes, you know. But I would say the biggest per thing of an alcoholic or an addict struggles with is the ability to pick up the damn telephone, you know. Call somebody before you go out and use or pick up that next drink, Yeah. which is part of what, you know, our club teaches, you know, guys in our club, because we make our prospects – Call everybody in the club at least once a week. And their pops, which is the guy that kind of sponsors them, you got to call him at least twice a week. It gets a person in the habit of picking up the telephone. It's a terrifying so thing nowadays. So when your ass is falling off, yeah. you know how to, you're, it, picking up the telephone is not such a big task. You're used to it. So you can say, hey, here's what's going on. And, I mean, dudes will just drop what they're doing and show up and be like, all right, let's go to a meeting or – Let's go have lunch or, you know, whatever. And, you know, that's what the whole phone list for AA is all about. You know, when your butt's falling off, pick up the phone and call somebody wow. before yeah. you go out and use. I mean, And eventually, over time, as you start to work through the steps and do that, picking up the phone gets easier. And the thought of going out and using gets less and less and less. But you also got to make sure you don't get complacent. Because if you're not doing the work and you think you're all fixed, you know, disease, disease of addiction is like, you know, you can get to a point where it's no longer control, controlling your life. But like I tell people, he's not gone. That addiction is not gone. He's back there in the background in the closet doing push-ups just waiting for you to slip up. And he's going to yeah. be in better shape when you slip than you are, you know, so you got to stay on top of it. I I mean, we've personally seen it so many times, like people will quit and then they think that they can just use a different substance instead. And it just takes them right back down, sometimes even worse. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, you just put yourself through all that and now you're back to it. And so like it's, you know, it's frustrating on it's, it's frustrating seeing people. But I mean, they, when there's such a social stigma to addiction, they think it's a moral dilemma or a, a, a lack of self-control and it's so much more than that you know it's I try to you know do we fault people who have cancer because they relapse on cancer you know it's it's a literally a clinical disease just like anything else yeah. I compare it to somebody having an allergy you know three people can drink alcohol and be absolutely fine I drink alcohol and I release this reaction that doesn't stop until crazy things happen, right? But you, but with that, like you do chemo for cancer, you take right. allergy pills for allergy. And I think a lot of these people with diseases aren't, or like these types of addiction diseases are not, like you said, doing their work. They're not taking that step to fix themselves right. because. Going to meetings is just a piece of that. Getting a sponsor, working the steps, reading the book, you know, putting pen to paper, that's all part of just like taking your medication. Yeah. You know, and if you're not taking your medication, things get worse. They don't get better. Exactly. 
And then you're just miserable because you're dry and not getting any better, you know, and then it feels like, what's the point? Being the sobered group versus like other groups. I mean, everybody, I mean, there's a stereotype, obviously. <laughs> um, so do other groups look at you differently or put you guys down like such as like, well, you used to be this way or um, don't forget where you come from type attitudes? Actually, no, we're actually received pretty well. Now, some of that is because we've earned that too, you know, um, but there are a lot of people that were in our club, brothers, if you will, that have moved on to Big Brother, and uh, which is, you know, to some a step up. Um, and so a lot of these other clubs you know, these notoriously, whatever, outlaw clubs, whatever you want to call them, they're starting to realize that, you know, the disease of addiction runs through their stuff too. And somebody who's that tied up into the disease of addiction is not really a safe person to be around either. Mm -hmm. So we're actually received pretty well. We still, you know, make introductions, make eye contact, you know, take our glasses off and gloves and shake people's hands. Um, we still have our own character defects, believe me. You know, if things were to happen, we'd still do whatever we had to do, you know. Yeah. But we don't go looking for trouble, you know. We're, we're about the recovery piece of it. And, and we've actually helped people in other clubs get and stay sober, which is what we wanted to do in the, the first place, you know. Being a sober motorcycle club was to be able to get into some areas where other people may not be able to get into. Yeah. You know, we're considered the premier clean and sober club in the state of Idaho, you know, so we get to go to different events and different things because we're invited as a club that other people wouldn't have access to. And so you're starting to see people that are sober in these other clubs. You know, there's clubs in Washington that are all sober clubs. You know, there's us here. There's guys in these other clubs that are actually sober, you know? And so I think that that stigma, because they knew who we are, they know we're men of honor, they know we're men of integrity, and, and, and they can see, yeah, they were here at one point, but now they're here, and yet they're still, you know, a men of, they're still men of their word, they still are accountable to each other, they still, you know, you're still the same people regardless. Better uh, yeah, in a yeah, lot of ways. Better. Yeah. But like you're like, I mean, you still have the same I, honor and stuff yes. regardless. Uh, but yeah, maybe more. And that's for our club anyway, you know, conflicted. That's kind of the foundation of who we are. Commitment, honor, and respect. We commit to our club. We respect our traditions. Therefore, we are honorable. That's kind of a, a huge thing for us. I guess like when we quit drinking, everybody looked at us like, you can't do this, or you guys are crazy, or like, oh, well, that's weird. I mean, it was like a big deal that we quit drinking, and people still look at us funny, or they think that we think that they're better than them, or like all these like emotions, like losing people like that are close to us because we quit drinking, heaven forbid. And like navigating that is hard, but like you had a group of people, like did your outside people like? Oh well, yeah, I had family that, you know, my mom's still around. My dad passed away in 2007, but I have family now. You know, it's, it's weird being in recovery. They supported me through that because they knew where I was and where I came from. And they know how messed up I was. But um, I, that's part of what the recovery program, you got to change your people, places, and things, right? Mm -hmm. I don't hang out with the same people I used to hang out with. I don't go to the same places I used to go, you know? And I don't do some of the things I used to do. But... That don't mean I don't know how to fun, have fun. That don't mean I still don't have a wild and crazy side. Right. The difference is I get to remember it all the next day. Yes. You know, yeah. I don't have to wake up hungover or trying to figure out where all my stuff was. You know, people talk about how they lost all this stuff in, in recovery meetings. And I always tell them, I didn't lose anything. 
I gave a lot of crap away. Yeah. Like, here, have my truck. I'll trade it for this. Or here, you know, I gave a ton of stuff away, including my freedom, you know. And the difference is, is I got sober and I took it back, you know. And, and now I've gotten to a point where I don't want to give it away anymore. I mean, I you think know. I read, a, I saw a quote somewhere. I'm not good at quoting things either, but it was what alcohol took from me, but what so- sobriety gave to me or, or something. And it's like, there's no regrets like quitting drinking because you gain so much. With and that's it. one of the things like in AA, they read the promises and it talks about, I don't regret to pass nor wish, nor wish to shut the door on it, you know, because that's part of who I am today. Like, you know, I got a lot of people tell me, well, why do you tell so many people? Why are you so open about going to prison? I said, because that's who I am. Mm-hmm. You know, am I proud of it? Absolutely not. Am I ashamed of it? No, because that's what it took to get me to where I am today. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that's also being authentic and like, yeah, without some of them hard lessons, I wouldn't be here. You know, I could still be out doing the same stupid stuff I was if I was around still. You know, and your relationship with your children is stronger and better. Much better now. Yeah, I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I was alienated for a while, but some of that was on them, and some of it wasn't. You know, some of it's what they were told growing up too. Yeah. So I can't. I don't have any control over that. I just had to be patient and 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 believe that eventually they would, you know, grow up mature and realize there's two sides to every story, but. You know, so I get along with my son now and my daughter, which took a while, Yeah. you know. So I just had to focus on me and keep doing what I was doing, and eventually they would see it, you know. And I think that's the biggest thing for um, us is our daughter made a comment to Jonathan one day, and he has not touched alcohol since. And then we did uh, 75 Hard together. I mean, that's a whole different topic, but... Um, and then like 20 ish days into it, I was like, Oh, I don't need alcohol anymore. It took like that first few weeks. And I was like, "Mm, like, what was it serving me? And then like, now that we're further along into it, it's like, I don't ever want to give up my kids for something so toxic. Right. I mean, like they, they don't deserve that. I mean, there's a lot of people that I know that, you know, lost their kids, but managed to get sober and get them back. You know, there's, there's some relationships that may not ever heal, you know, be healed again. My dad died before I really had a chance to show him, you know, what my life was like sober. But I also knew he was dying. So we got to have some long heart-to-heart conversations that probably wouldn't have happened otherwise, you know. Yeah. But now I don't, have to, I don't have to leave things unsaid anymore, you know. If I screw up and do something I shouldn't have done. I own it right away and I go back and I fix it and I don't have to carry that crap with me, you know? I used to just carry all that stuff like a luggage suitcase full of crap and it would just fester and fester and fester, yeah. you know? And I don't have to do that anymore, you know? And it's weird because I got my recovery and I got my club and like I said, they, they intertwine in some ways but they're also completely separate, you know? And we kind of worked hard to design ourselves the way we are so that we had access to some of those areas that normal people wouldn't have access to. I mean, I liked how you said you're with your group that if you drank, you feel like you failed your brothers. I mean, that is huge accountability. Like that, that community is so strong. And that's, I mean, that's what's kept me accountable is having my YouTube channel because mm. I was like, oh, crap, I'm going to be failing all these people <laughs> that right. drink and, like, failing others around me that have, you know, looked up to me from quitting drinking. Like, I mean, I wasn't in and out of jail or anything, but I'm sure I would have ended up heading that direction. Well, in that last relapse I had, I literally, my club said, okay, here's what you got to do. And so I had to call every single member and tell them what happened when it happened, why it happened. That's a humbling thing to go through. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I'm not doing this crap anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned a lot from it too. You know, yeah. I was able to look at it and say, hmm. You know, I learned that I was setting myself up to do it long before it ever happened. I learned that there's certain things I don't want to have to go through again, like calling everybody and telling them why and what happened. And 
you know, it's, it's, don't think all the crazy and the character defects are gone because, in fact, I just read a thing this morning that said, you know, a lot of them will be removed. Some of them won't. Some will get better. You know, I think some of them stick around just to keep us in check. Yeah. You know, so that we still have to keep doing the work. Otherwise, we'd get too complacent and go back to doing what we were doing before. You know, that maintenance of the spiritual condition so that we stay in tune with ourselves and everyone around us so that we don't go back to the old habits and the old behaviors. So in the beginning, whenever you, like, I guess I'm not super familiar with AA. Um, when you are struggling and you want, you have a craving or something, do you guys just call each other? That's what the principle of that's all set up to do. Hey, I'm messed up emotionally right now, or I'm having these thoughts, or I want to go use... The thought is you're going to pick up the phone, whether it's your sponsor or somebody else, and say, hey, here's what's going on in my head or my life right now. Yeah. And usually somebody will say, okay, let's go to a meeting or let's go have lunch or let's go something, you know, and, yeah. and, and get them out of the situation. And sometimes they'll drag them to help somebody else. And then all of a sudden whatever's going on with you is, doesn't seem nearly as important as it did before, you know, but that's, that's how that program's designed, you know. If you get out of yourself for just a minute, then you realize, hey, this is not such a crisis. Yeah. Or it gives you enough time to deal with whatever's going on, you know. Because um. I ride motorcycles all the time. There's still times driving down the freeway that I tell people that they're number one all the time. Because people drive like idiots. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, like, yeah, if that comes sober or not. It I mean, does, like, yeah. <laughs> and I think, yeah, some of our personality traits definitely stay with us. They're just oh, not yeah. as intense. Right. Maybe. Um, but, like, because we still have all the feelings and emotions and whatnot. I mean, we can, I don't know. I heard somebody, I, I can't even remember who it was anymore, but they were talking about how they thought alcoholics and addicts were, uncaring and unfeeling and on this and 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 really what they found out is exactly the opposite that alcoholics and addicts tend to overfeel everything they're so hyper you know hyper emotional and hypersensitive which is why we drink and use in the first place because we don't know how to process through all of that that's a good one yeah because as soon as you start feeling any emotion you ah. yeah you grab a <laughs> bottle right and you don't know how to like cope with it like i I think I realized that on, I'm going to say Mother's Day this year, because we're, I'll be, he's over, Jonathan's over a year, but I'll be a year in July. But it's like, you sit on Mother's Day, and I was like, gosh, I was so emotional. I'm like, wow, like, I've been masking this every single year for definitely a few years, and now I had to actually sit in it mm -hmm. and feel those emotions. And feel it and process through it, and, you yeah. know, yeah. It's not, I mean, it's not fun, and then you just have to, like, I mean, we ended up going to Top Golf and having an active day, but it's like, gosh, like usually I would sit and just drink all day because I was emotional. Well, that's where it helps to have people in your life that know where you're at because they yeah. can be like, all right, you know, for whatever, you know, let's say it was my dad's anniversary of his death, you know, uh, they're not going to leave me to go off by myself and do, st you know what I mean? It, it, yeah. When you know about those intimate details of people's lives, you're able to be able to be present and show up and help them through their stuff. Yeah. And all of a sudden, your stuff seems minimal. I you think know? support is huge when it comes to quitting drinking. I'm at the point where I have what I call Cadillac problems nowadays. You know? <laughs> I don't have. I don't wake up wonder how where I'm going to sleep or oh. how I'm going to pay my bills or you yeah. know, am I going to have a vehicle to drive? Now I'm like, you know. How much can I help my kid in college today? You know, should I buy this or shouldn't I buy this? You know, should I spend this money? Shouldn't I? You know, I don't have to worry about my bills are paid every month. And I had to learn how to do that. I had to learn how to take a check, put it in the bank and pay my <laughs> bills because that was foreign to me. You know, I had to learn how to save money because that was also foreign to me. Because all your money went to yeah, other things? Yeah, everything. Yeah, everything else. And, you know. I have good credit now, which is weird because I never had credit or good credit for years. I mean, there's people that spend like thousands of dollars a month on alcohol. I mean, and drugs. Like, I mean, I was never into drugs, but like, I mean, I've seen definitely some users. But I mean, alcohol, like 
bottles are like 50 it's bucks a pop. It's not cheap, yeah. And that's like every other day. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like that adds up real quick. Super fast. And God forbid if you're, you know, a high-end alcoholic or you like the really expensive stuff, you know. I've had that conversation with somebody close to me that, you know, you don't have to drink every day to be an alcoholic. You know, the only real definition of alcoholic is once you start, you can't stop. Yeah. Whether that's on weekends, you know, you got to drink every weekend or once you pick up a drink, you don't stop until it's all gone. You know, there's a lot of different, you don't have to be homeless with your yes. bottle in a in a, pl- a paper bag, you know, sleeping on the street <laughs> that, to be an alcoholic. That is that is the prime example I tell people. I'm like, maybe I wasn't the like against a brick wall with the bottle in a paper bag type alcoholic, but like, yeah, I was the one that like once I start, I cannot stop. And I mean, it affected me tremendously. <laughs> you know, and I think I started drinking and using early on because it it hid those feelings of inadequacy. It hid those feelings of feeling awkward. You know, yeah. all of a sudden I was the life of the party. Yeah. You know, I was the crazy guy. You and then know, you just, I was the, you like that feeling, so you just absolutely. keep running with it. Yeah, absolutely. And that was like, everybody will comment. They're like, well, you, you're, maybe you're the problem or you were the, uh, I don't know. I was the environment. And I was like, well, I mean, I'm not saying I'm not. I'm just right. saying like, you grow up a certain way, and then you learn that alcohol can ease some a lot of these things and make you feel the better. Social and you just, lubricant, yeah. as I've heard it called. Yes, <laughs> then you just run with it, and then that's the only thing you know in life. It's like I've told my son, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what you can and can't do. I could give you the information that it runs in the family, and nine times out of ten, by the time you realize it's a problem, it's already too late. Yeah. I said, but the choice is still up to you. Does he drink? He does. I said, you've seen my life, you know. He's never, he thinks he has. He's never seen me actually use drugs. But because he's heard so much growing up, you know, it's in his mind that he's Mm -hmm. seen it. But that's okay. But he's got all those precursors already, you know. He's 23 years old and a baseball player for Eastern Oregon, you know. So, yeah. But I'm like... If you ever have questions, I'm here. I'm not here to tell you, you know, and I'm not here to tell you you're me. Yeah. Because you're not. My grandma, she, like, in the beginning of all this, she's like, I didn't realize how bad it was. If I knew how bad it was, I would have, like, done something. Like, there's something you could have done. Like, we have to make the decision on our own. Nobody can fix it for you. Yeah. And that's the hard part because they want to, you want to take people and strangle them and, like, (laughs) but, like, we have to literally do it on our own. You want to shake them and say, why do you not just see this, you know? I mean, and I know, like, I can't have a sip of alcohol or, like, it will take me right back down to where I left. As soon as I take that first sip, it opens that closet door and lets the beast out. Yeah. And maybe I'll be able to put him away again. Maybe I won't, you know. Yeah. That's a risk you take, you know. Maybe you're going to die in a car crash. Maybe you're going to drink yourself to death. Maybe you're going to overdose, you know, whatever it is. You never know. Yeah, you know? it's a scary feeling. We've come from misdemeanors and felonies and all near pretty much rock bottom and didn't think that you were going to be a nurse. And now you are here 21 years later. You've overcome prison. I mean, a lot of people think that just because they've failed a couple of times that they're going to be a complete failure their whole life. But you are definitely like that example that you can come from the bottom and get to the top. Yeah, uh, I never, it's weird because I never really look at myself like that. But um, I think for me, it was just a matter, it's a matter of tenacity Mm -hmm. of never giving up, you know. Um, Once I realized, hey, this is a problem and and I was willing to do the work to fix the problem, you know. I used to joke that the quickest way to get me to do something was to tell me I couldn't do it. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, not only can I do it, I'll do it twice as stupid as you think I will. (laughs) But what I've learned in recovery is, is to be able to take that same tenacity and turn it into a positive direction. Mm-hmm. So as stubborn as I am, and Lord knows I'm plenty stubborn, now I, I put it in a positive direction instead of a negative direction, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think they Because I've that. got enough recovery under my belt now, I don't have the desire to drink and use, you know. But I'm still just as stubborn and crazy as I ever was. 
Um, but what is your, like, you're such a, an example for those that are struggling so hard. Don't, don't give up before the miracle happens, you know. Keep, you know, if you slip, you dust yourself off, you get up, and you get right back at it, you know. And eventually you're going to hear enough or read enough or get involved in recovery enough that it's going to stick, yeah. you know. Um, and then when it sticks, that's when the, the crazy stuff really starts to happen. Things start to change. Things get better. You know, your life becomes so much better than you ever thought it would be. That's true. You know, if you'd have told me, at, you know, 25 years ago that I was going to have a truck and two motorcycles and own my own home and, you know, I'd have thought you were crazy. I didn't think I'd live past 30. You know, and here I am 54 years old, and I'm like, okay, now I'm actually starting to get old. I'm starting to feel it. I'm like, this, I did not plan well for my future at all. <laughs> but I mean, but now you're helping other people get sober and, you know, raising money for charities. I mean, you've definitely like. We do a lot of that. Um, and that's, in, in my mind, that's part of service too. We get to give back to the community. Because yeah. for so many of us, for so long, we took and took and took. So being able to give back is, is what we kind of thrive on. You know, we raise money every October for the Hayes House so that we can buy Christmas presents for whoever's in the Hayes House. And we've gotten them furniture and we've gotten them blankets for their beds. And, and usually if we have money, we'll go in at Thanksgiving and, and try and do a special meal or something for them. We've been known to pick them up in a limo and take them to dinner. And, awesome. and we got bikes in front and back and we escort them there and escort them back. I mean, and the looks of joy on these kids' face is just priceless, you know, and, and that's the kind of things we do on a regular basis now, you know, and, and, and I love it. Doing it sober and present. I mean, like. And we actually have a Facebook page, you know, oh, you where know. we post everything we do and, and the events we got coming up and, and, you know, it's Conflicted MC on Facebook. It's Conflicted MC. Yeah, and it's it's cool. And then what's your, uh, remind me, the um, bonfire? It's Friday Fire Pit Meeting is what it's called. Okay. That's also on Facebook. Yeah. And it talks about the meetings and what you can bring. And Larry's usually pretty good about posting ahead of time of here's what we're having this week, you know, burgers or dogs or, yeah. you know, whatever. And and you know, bring some sides or whatever. And it's always at their house. So it's, nice. it's, it's a great time and that's great recovery. And there's a lot of years of recovery there too. A lot of new guys too, but that's okay. You know, and of course everything we do as a club for all the charities is all donation based. So, you know, we're out there hitting the pavement all year round trying to, to get sponsors. And, you know, we have support gear that, is usually all recovery based you know, hats and shirts and stuff we sell at the clubhouse and trying to raise money to be able to keep doing the charity and all the stuff that we want to do throughout the year. Yeah, I like the name conflicted. It seemed appropriate because we were talking about, you know, when we were trying to come up with a name of, you know, we want to live in this world, but we want to also be in this world and, and, you know, how we conflict within ourselves, you know, the good evil, if you will, Versus, you know, the recovery world versus the motorcycle world and, and conflicted just kind of yeah. seemed to be the word that fit. I mean, because well, we've only known, like, drunk bikers. I yeah. mean, that's like... <laughs> you know, inherently, you know, the biker world is all party and this and that, you know. And, and there's a lot of sober clubs out there now. Yeah, you know? that's good to know. I mean, because when you're trapped, not trapped, that's not the word, when you're... St like stuck stuck yes like there's so much more out there and you don't have to be stuck in the same place no and still do the, what you love to do and on one of our recovery hats it says if you're not having fun you're not doing it right you know you're just it's not about getting sober and being miserable it's about getting sober and starting to live again yes you know and enjoy life and and you know be be that productive member of society again, you know? Yeah. Be present, you know? Not just in your own life, but in the lives of the people around you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. Uh, we thank you for the lives we live. We know the risks, we know the fun that comes with it. 
it's the last smiling place of my brother Darren. He uh, did so many shit show shenanigans and uh, gave so many blessings. We ask you to watch over him while he's up there and uh, we'll join him one day. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. If you found this video helpful, please make sure to check out my other videos for more insights and tips. Stay strong, stay informed, and take care of yourself. I will see you in the next video.